Welcome to the Victoria Festival of Authors 2020. Though this is a virtual event, Victoria Festival of Authors is located on the traditional ancestral territories of the Nguangan people, also known as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. We acknowledge the ancestors, hereditary leaders, and matriarchs, as well as the creators of these lands, and give thanks for the privilege of living and working here. We are committed to serving as learners and as listeners. Hello, my name is Kagan McFadden, and I am the president of the Board of Directors for the Victoria Festival of Authors. Welcome to Great Minds Don't Think Alike, featuring authors John Barton, Lorna Crozier, Kieran, Reg Kieran Regeer, and Madeline Sonic. I want to thank our sponsors, the BC Arts Council, Canada Council for the Arts, the City of Victoria, the CRD, Government of BC, the United Way of Greater Victoria, Monroe Books, the League of Canadian Poets, and the Writers Union of Canada. A special thank you to the Greater Victoria Public Library for their generous sponsor sponsoring of this event. This event, as well as all VFA events, offers closed captioning. Please click the double C at the bottom of your screen to view captions. Please also use the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen if you have questions for us or for the authors during this event. The moderator will be able to get some of these questions near the end of the panel. <laughs> uh, this panel is moderated by Daryl McLeod. Daryl is Cree from Territory 8 in Alberta. He was the Chief Negotiator of Land Claims and the federal, for the Federal Government and Executive Director of Education and International Affairs with the Assembly of First Nations. Daryl holds degrees in French literature and education. Uh, Peyagao, his second memoir following the events of his Governor General Literary Award winning Mamasgach, A Cree Coming of Age, will be out in March 2021, so watch for that. Uh, Daryl lives, writes, sings, and plays jazz guitar in Souk, BC, and Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Over to you, Daryl. Good evening. It's a pleasure and an honor to be uh, on moderating this panel. Daryl Isiega, so why out sinia a Miss Quachi was Kaigan Utsinia. As I was saying, it's a true pleasure to, to be here with you this evening to be moderating this panel with uh, an amazing group of authors. It's it's a true honor. Um, Daryl Isiega, so why out sinia a Miss Quachi. seem to be having some technical challenges here. I'm hoping my microphone is now unmuted and my video is on. Um, I just did a, I don't know if you got it, but I did a, a traditional Cree introduction of myself. Um, just telling you that I'm from Northern Alberta and uh, that my mother's name is Bertha Dora and my father's name is uh, Clifford James. So uh, it gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce the authors for tonight. And um, I look forward to taking your questions. Um, I, after the readings by the authors, I will um, ask a few questions myself, and then we'll have time for questions from the audience. So I hope you'll be keen and uh, send us your well-formulated questions so we can get you some, some great answers from these amazing authors. So John Barton um, is our first author, and uh, John um, has been Victoria's poet in residence and um, has um, kindly agreed to read tonight from his memoir, Lost Family. And um, <laughs> as you'll see when you get uh, John's memoir, it's not your typical memoir. It's written in sonnets which is a remarkable feat. Uh, so congratulations on that accomplishment, John, and uh, I'm sure everybody will enjoy your presentation and your reading. So I'll turn it over to you uh, for your reading, John. 
Um, thank you, Daryl. And uh, thank you to the festival. I'm going to read five sonnets. And as I was reviewing them today, I realized that they're each set in a different city. I grew up in Calgary. And so the first sonnet is about um, the experience of urbanization in the, uh, in, the, in the 60s and the 70s. A 20th century roadmap to settler architecture. The land was flat then, inarticulate. No trees stood against the sky. My shadow, the tallest structure I knew. Two matched rows of houses, the time span of our street built to affirm no opposites. Drapes at dusk pulled across sight lines. Childhood, a crawl space, the future rose out of. Echo sustained by slide rules of dry air, blueprints trusted. Open spaces drawing cross beams of thought, each roof the wind-blown wings of a city. New hypotheses, new towers ascending. Their assured axes, the conduits I've thought sought through words. The freeways clear tonalities, blinding the stars with light past amending. The second sonnet is set in one of the scuzziest gay bars in Ottawa. School of Zires Fino. Toxic, the club where we met. Run down now, run down then. The Johns sequined with beer. Dim crush of moon flesh dancing. The strobes freeze frame history painting, a stock animation. Mirror balls, matches, condoms, sweat raw limbs, Shedding shirts, shedding disco, shrill amyl nitrate, Doc Martens, plucked or pierced eyebrows, ripped chinos, zigzagging tans, shyness shunned, sherry, your cheeky decanted ploy to haul me home to fortify us both, pouring dryly from our clothes after scorching cold flamed our skin, run from din, making you bold air smokeless, one candle lit, till you wore me out and down, our legs dawn slaked and sprawled. The next sonnet is set in Toronto, and it is a tribute to the victims of Douglas MacArthur, the uh, serial killer that terrorized the gay village. Coda for the victims. It takes no self-consciousness to guess how a landscaper could pick them. The tapped swipe of their profiles, such null bodies his type, disassembled already by the cropped gaze of their smartphones, parts isolated from their eyes, shaved or engorged, trunks of brown skin, oceans away from home, or ground down by what being born here has made them prey to. Invasive species, he would text lines and root from cover with the funk of sex. Horny men used to rough white hands, not death. Strip limbs he disjoints before he consigns them. To mulch, he rakes flat. Unseen index of those too few miss us all psychopaths. And the next poem is set in Victoria at the breakwater, which is my favorite place. Last of the Catchers. I've never caught sight of what they catch. Boys static as old men. Old men less awkward than boys. Patient as herons. As lizards, wrists flicked quick as tongues flies pierced and deployed, the lines cast far and teased, cast far and te teased, what cold voids the hooks slip through, flat and clear as quartz, or rough, 
catchers swamped as waves rear, the lines cast far and teased, cast far and teased. Neither sculpin nor octopi striking on bait, stone blocks stood on descending stairs, numb to the logic they blast below insistent tides as cormorants shriek, torpedo through reflected sky to spear vanished prey, shrugging off the undertow. And the final uh, sonnet is, um, begins in Port Angeles and ends in Calgary and is about my sister who uh, died five years ago and really is the inspiration for this book. Arrival and Departure. My collarbone lightly broken, you took me camping. Marine layer damp in my hair as I stepped off the ferry alone. Bareheaded, sunburnt nose stung by kelp and looked felt awkward till you stood out from the crowd waiting for foot traffic to clear customs, calm, sisterly, and pleased I'd crossed. The sum of the sea's pull, collapsed crash of surf loud in my ear, when years later I'm adrift by your bed as two nurses unhook you, your body a raft too wrecked to hold you here, unanchored as you seldom were, tipped safe with provision stowed and course plotted. Our fingers slip not, my grip can't keep taut. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, John. I had the pleasure of working with John uh, when he was the editor at the Malhat Review. He edited uh, one of my first stories that got published a number of years ago. and. Uh, in addition to being a phenomenal poet, he's also a wonderful editor. So we're going to move on to uh, Lorna Crozier. And um, Lorna, is, Lorna is an officer, an officer of the Order of Canada. She's published a memoir and 18 books of poetry, most recently God of Shadows and The House of Spirit Built. She's the recipient of many honors, including the Governor General's Award and five honorary doctorates. Stephen Price called Through the Garden, A Love Story with Cats, her latest nonfiction book, one of the greatest love stories of our time. And I have some breaking news um, uh, with respect to Lorna. She was, um, uh, it was announced yesterday, I believe, that she's a finalist for the Hillary Weston Writers Trust Nonfiction Prize. So congratulations, Lorna, and take it away. Thank you very much, Daryl. Uh, John, I have to say those were exquisitely wrought sonnets, so lovely to hear them. Uh, my, my memoir, which is nonfiction, is studded with poems, and it begins with a poem called Poem Me. I came to him that first night and said, poem me, and he did. He came to me that first night and said, poem me, and I did. Of our hours, we made a poem. Of our years, we made a poem. Many things happened in between. Many things were rubbed out, repeated, neglected, ignored, stained, thrown away. But this morning, he said, poem me. This morning, I said, poem me. And we made of our lives a poem. Our hours of working outside in the garden, singly or side by side, have been a way to express contrition to the earth, to nurture habitats that attract bees and dragonflies, birds, beetles, and spiders, that shelter fish and turtles, raccoons, bats, mice, and moles. Our sweat and muscle strain become part of the soil we dig and weed and fertilize and part of the water we tend so the fish can slip through our dreams. At our first pond in Saskatoon in the mid 80s, as we sat outside at dusk, watching the koi rise to the touch of Patrick's fingers as he had trained them to do, he said, the fish 
are the water's thoughts. A man who can come up with that is a man I'll never leave, I said to myself. It was over 30 years ago. In caring for our patch of earth, we make a home for each other. We become each other's home, no matter how often we've had to move for residencies, for part-time jobs, for sessional appointments, and finally for my position at the University of Victoria. Where we go, we go together. And what we've left behind, both inside and out, has been made more beautiful through our love and labor. Directly across the road from our driveway is Coles Bay Park. Close to nine acres, it's a stand of trees growing on two sides of the deep ravine that drops about 20 feet to the ocean. The trees are second or third growth cedars and firs and Gary Oak, along with younger maples, all of them shrouded in English ivy, an invasive plant some idiot settler brought from the old country a century ago and let loose in the wild. Carpeting most of the forest floor, it's impossible to eradicate, but before he fell ill, Patrick headed out with secateurs twice a week to cut through the vines and free the trees from choking. I started to go with him. It was three years of hard, dirty work. When we hacked through a stem, then yanked at the ivy that towered above, all kinds of debris fell on our heads. Some of the vines were as thick as a line breaker's thigh, and Patrick had to use a bow saw to slice through their grip. I found it difficult to keep my footing. Logs I thought would hold me turned out to be punky and collapsed with my weight. Countless times I slammed onto my bum into a well of deep, wet foliage and had to grab a root to pull myself up. We both laughed at my clumsiness. This was one way to learn the secrets of trees. Patrick, who unlike me is used to forests, is more graceful, but once out there alone and balancing on the edge of the ravine to get at the other side of a large fir, his foot broke through the down trunk that had been supporting him, and he tumbled vertically through 15 feet of blackberry canes, salal, and multi-pronged branches to finally bang his body into the stones at the bottom of the creek that ran into the bay. I heard him come through the door and rose from my office to find a wounded, bleeding man. His face and arms were scraped and scored, and he'd cracked his ribs on his right side, where he'd hit the ground first. Yet after just a week away, we went back for two more years of cutting ivy until every tree in the grove was freed from its green strangulation. There's probably no better way of getting to know a forest. We touched each one of the 400 trees and they touched us back. No words were needed, but we felt each other across species boundaries, across the years, across their knowing and ours, bark and flesh, sap and blood, speaking and not speaking. We shared the same wind and rain during our hours among them. We suffered through drought. Perhaps it was fancy, but I felt sure the cedars and firs, some of them hundreds of years old, freed from their decades of choking, breathed a sigh of relief and stretched their limbs higher into the sky. We had helped them do that. Had we ever done anything better? Through our bedroom sliding glass doors, from my pillow, I can look across the yard and the road to the tall outer fringe of green that borders the park. Each of the trees has felt our hands, heard our voices, and breathed in our smell as we've torn at the ivy. Not knowing what to pray to during Patrick's first hospital stay, 
when I feared he wasn't getting better. Every night I prayed to them, to the cedars, the firs, the oaks, the scrub maple. He was so good to you, I said out loud. Please use all of your ancient energy, your primal power to bring this man who works so hard to save you safely home. May he, like you, reach tall and strong, his beautiful daydreamy head touching the sky. May he grow older than old beside you. Well, thank you so much, Lorna. That's so, so touching and so incredible. And I can hardly wait to get my hands on the physical copy of your book. Uh, for you and John, uh, I, uh, I had the pleasure of looking at um, the galley copies and uh, a virtual version. So uh, I can't wait to get my hands on the paper copies. Such rich work from both of you. Thank you. Hi, hi. So moving on to Kieran Regeer. Um, Kieran Regeer's first collection, Cult Life, was listed by CBC as poetry to watch out for. Kieran has twice received grants from the Canada Council of the Arts and enjoyed several years on the poetry board of the Malhat Review. Her work has appeared in journals and anthologies in Canada, Australia, and America, most recently in the Literary Review of Canada and The Riddle Fence. So take it away, Kieran. So nice to have you with us. Thank you so much, Daryl. And I must say it's a privilege to share a screen, the screen, the stage with Lorna and with John and with Madeline. Thank you. This is the uh, first poem from the book, which is a, a narrative of sorts in poetry about time spent in an ashram. So this is called Inventory. And there's a little quote from Nietzsche. It, uh, it reads, poets treat their experiences shamelessly. They exploit them. Inventory. Nine Vipassana meditators stuck in the cycle of craving, five ex-Krishnas, six transcendentals, four Saibaba devotees, one raped by Adobe at the Puttaparthi ashram, a pair of Ashtanga yoga instructors flipping headstands in back of the dining hall, a visiting Tibetan Buddhist, two Scientologists, 17 grazing seekers hugged by Amma, one spooky Rosicrucian, one moony Wiccan priestess, eight Osho followers pretzled in tantric rapture, a Brazilian trance healer channeling the famous Dr. Fritz, performing psychic surgery on the faithful, Three loud mouths, quoting Dal Fri John, a rather fragrant incense maker from Sri Aurobindo's, one wandering sadhu, wandering on. One loud assistant to a quantum physicist turned New Age pyramid marketer peddling magical water. One chiropractor, two Reiki masters, a homeopathic kinesiologist, a palm full of oily massage therapists in and out of bedrooms, uncricking necks and jump-starting meridians. Three chartered accountants diddling the books and a high-end psychic once hired to sense glitches in corporate power. One Mary Kay millionaire, two trust fund babies, all hoovered clean long before they leave. One florid French painter hanging art in the foyer, waiting for the master to declare his wizardry. A brawny Austrian philosopher renaming himself Vinnie, Eleven Aussies, mostly bronzed, expected to perform words like g'day. One iffy guy with a black toothed grin hiding out in a basement room rumored to have been a pedophile. Seven twenty-somethings singing passionately in Polish, dunking each other in the pool. Eight cool Kiwis, two hot Russians, half a pint of warm Brits. Four Dutch waiters over six foot three, a clutch of Canadians hunting green cards, one woos an ex-stripper with a pawn shop glitter bit, ditches her a week post vows. Four sous chefs, six line cooks, 13 hopeful waitresses, half a dozen handymen quietly hammering, screwing towel hooks, hanging mirrors in the bathrooms of the waitresses. 
a 12 pack of preteens, a skewed diamond of little leaguers, one gifted kid in a wheelchair, five barefoot toddlers with mucky faces, and an eight year old sociopath pied pipering the littlies over the highway and deep into the cornfields. Six single mums, two jilted dads, two trenchant lesbian couples candying the kids, cold shouldering the parents. Three women with cancer careening around the master, expecting to be healed. They all pass three, two, one through dorm room 203. One man on the quiet, borrowing lacy lingerie from the laundry room. Norma Jean Soul Twin with an urgent smile tangled in a sheet, exposing a nipple at her window. One two timing double bass jazz genius, one real Broadway dancer from Cats, one concert pianist with arthritic perfect pitch, one opera baritone, his soprano spurned in Berlin, one gay jet DJ wearing headphones like a tiara, one emo prima ballerina who goes Jim Morrison in a hotel bathroom a month after leaving. Seven lead guitarists, four half-decent drummers, a full gospel choir, enough brass for Motown. Two dozen amateur thespians monologuing to save the world. A dresser from London's West End, ready to rip the stitches out of physical existence. A pathological narcissist who will one day die of self-awareness. A balding blues diva, an aging would-be country queen an ex-punk rocker who'd opened for DOA in Regina, and a couple of writers, the fiction gal now hobnobbing Toronto's writerly royalty, the poet handling histories shamelessly. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Kieran. Um, that's one of the most remarkable use, poetic uses of lists that I've ever read and, and heard. Brilliant. Um, I hope I can uh, uh, learn that talent at some point. Thank you for that wonderful reading. So next is Madeline Sonic. Um, Madeline is an award-winning and eclectic writer, anthologist and teacher who lives in Victoria. Her books include a novel, Arms, short fiction, Drawing the Bones, a children's novel, Belinda and the Dust Bunnies, two poetry collections. Uh, her volume of personal essays, Afflictions and Departures was nominated for the BC National Award for Canadian Nonfiction. And when I read it, I understood why. It was also a finalist for the Charles Taylor Prize and won the 2012 City of Victoria Butler Book Prize. Uh, and Madeline is the author of Fontainebleau. So take it away, Madeline. Thank you very much, Daryl, and, and thank you all for uh, this opportunity to, to read with you all tonight. This is just fantastic. Um, I'm glad that we haven't had too many glitches yet. And maybe now come wood, but um, okay. This is airtime. It's the opening uh, story in Fontainebleau, and Fontainebleau is a, a collection of linked stories. Darkness saturates the bar and amber light glints off bottles of bourbon and rye. Julia Wilson's thin face is only a shadow in the bartender's mirror. The man, Mike Riddell, orders her a draft. The other, Steve Finnegan, gets one for Audrey Slack. Neither of the men have thought to ask the girls' names. The music, without melody, pounds like a frenetic heart. Both girls swallow golden liquid. The roller coaster at the fair with its smooth tubular rails, with its chilling dive drop and loop the loop, screeched to a halt over an hour ago. The operator left the ghostly park. Only a desert of animate trash remains, tumbleweeds rushing out past the railroad tracks, out to the highway. Only the disembodied smells of popcorn and sweat roam the ground, but there is a bar still open and Mike and Steve push the girls to drink. They push them to chug, chug a lug, chug a lug. They order a pitcher and introduce another drinking game. 
Julia smiles and Audrey giggles. They're like two little girls at a birthday party. Runaways, the men think. Thrill seekers, bored with the safety of childhood. Mike pulls a quarter from the pocket of his jeans. He's got a long, thin scar on his wrist, a childhood wound where a kid once cut him with a pair of scissors. So what you do is this, he says, his mouth sloppy with beer. Player one flips a coin, player two calls it. If she's wrong, she's got to take three swigs or alternately, Steve interjects, take something off. Audrey's laughter peals like the chime of hollow metal, like the sound of her inebriated mother's drinking cup drops from her senseless hands. There's a rose tattoo on Audrey's shoulder and Steve touches it and asks if it's for real. Her dexterous fingers make L's of each hand. Loser, she teases and pushes the L's against his chest. What, Steve smirks, it could be one of those stick on jobs. Julia flips the coin. She's beautiful, but more serious than Audrey, less effusive. Audrey's happy lips are thinner. She has a slight overbite. Julia's lips are fuller. She has perfect teeth. In fact, everything about Julia is pinup perfect, which makes Steve and Mike think the family she's running from is more well-to-do. Tail, she calls and her small pale hand unfurls. The silver dish shines like a moon from her palm, the lines on both almost non-existent. Heads, Mike announces. The men chuckle. Audrey picks up her glass. Mike's hand steals under Julia's long black hair, under the back of her summer tank. Her soft flesh puckers, tail she calls and wins. But Mike lifts her glass and makes her drink anyway. Party pooper, he says, when she's had enough and pushes the beer away. Earlier that evening on the roller coaster, she pressed into him, her body, a feather sculpted by wind. She tried to pull free, but the centrifugal force flung her even closer. Don't mind if I do, Mike said, opening towards her. She couldn't hear him, the din of the rattling car and the plummety cries that rose from the first drop drowned him out. Then they were at the top of the hill looking down, feeling that sudden plunge that lifted them from their seats with exhilarating weightlessness. It was called airtime, and Mike would have liked to explain all of its gravitational intricacies to her, even though he knew she wouldn't understand any of them. She was still glued against him when she let loose with an ear-splitting scream. It reminded him of times gone by, things he'd forgotten and didn't want to remember. But he was glad she'd screamed, glad he'd heard exactly what her lungs could do. Steve refills Audrey's glass and orders another pitcher. I'm hungry, Audrey, Audrey announces, and takes three small obligatory sips for guessing wrong. Steve grinds his thigh against her bony hip and she strokes his arm. He'd rather not order food. He'd rather have nothing interfere with the alcohol. But Mike calls the waitress back. The waitress has been drinking. It's on her breath and in the tired inattention of her eyes. She produces her order book, nods towards Mike and says, shoot. Steve tries to get Mike's attention but he's focused on the tattered cardboard menu. He orders two pounds of honey garlic chicken wings, potato skins, and a basket of nachos. Steve wishes there was some way to stop him, some way to remind him of the dangers of food. Not only will it delay intoxication, but they're going to be dealing with a real puking hazard once they give the girls the drugs. Thank you. Well, that was wonderful, Madeline. Thank you so much. So that concludes our readings. And um, we have time for discussion and, um, and some questions from the audience, from the public. Uh, so 
If you haven't, I have a few questions that I've uh, noted and that I'll ask in a bit. Um, but I would like to get a bit of a panel discussion going first with a couple of questions that, that I've formulated. There's so many ways to tell one story, or at least part of it. Um, I'm curious about how each of you chose the form, structure, and style you did for your pieces. Um, we have uh, memoirs written in, in, in sonnet form, which I, I think is probably a historic first. I'm not sure, but it likely is. And then we have a memoir that's a blend of uh, lyrical prose, I would say, and, and, and poems. And then a piece of a work of fiction that's told in um, a collection of linked short stories. But Madeline, you also wrote a memoir that was a, a, a different format than your typical memoir. So I'd just like to open a discussion to the panel uh, uh, with that question. Um, how did you choose the form, structure, and style you did for the, the works that were that you read from tonight? And it's open, so whoever wants to start, uh, please go ahead. I don't mind starting. Um, I think that I didn't choose the form in a way. The form chose me, Carol. I, uh, when Patrick fell uh, very, very ill towards the end of 2016, and I started to worry about him, I thought the only way I'm going to be able to get out of bed and get through this and be the loving, attentive partner that he needed was to write. It's my survival mechanism. Whether that's shameful or admirable, I still don't know. But I would go into my room and uh, at a certain point, at least three times a week, I would try to find what I was feeling and try to find a way to express my fear and my worry and try to find meaning in what was going on um, in our relationship that was almost 40 years old at that point. And prose just seemed to be the, the proper thing to do. It was the least decorative, um, the most sort of solid thing I could turn to. Although I think I did treat the prose kind of like a poem, mm. but I couldn't have imagined it being in any other form, even though I've spent most of my life as a poet. It wasn't time for poetry. It was time for the harder metal of prose. Well, I'm glad we're, we're recording this, Lorna, because that's, that's a beautiful quote that you just put out there. Yeah. It wasn't a time for poetry. Wow. From, from a seasoned poet. I think um, the sonnet was an accident. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> An accident only a poet could have. <laughs> yeah. Um, about, I think it was 2016, um, the, when I was still the editor of the Mel Hat Review, uh, I brought Molly Peacock to Victoria to give a lecture on the relationship between poetry and creative nonfiction. And um, it was, you know, with uh, university funds, so I was obliged to um, arrange other gigs for her so the university could get its. Um, worth. And so I arranged for her to go into a class with a second year class taught by Carla Funk. And since I'd gone to all the trouble of bringing her to Victoria, I thought I'd benefit. And so I had no idea what um, Molly was going to do, but she basically explained to the students um, uh, the rudiments of writing sonnets of which she's renowned. And my favorite image was she, it, the uh, room was arranged, the table was arranged, so there was a well in the middle between all these tables. And she described writing a sonnet as like slowly unrolling your yoga mat. <laughs> and um, so I had to borrow a pen, I think I did have paper, and I wrote a sonnet in half an hour. And um, I was kind of amazed and um, <sighs> life gets busy. So I realized I could write a sonnet quickly in a spare moment. And um, my sister had died just the year before. And I was qu quite intrigued by the idea of the relationship between creative nonfiction and poetry. So the two things came together. In fact, the file on my computer, the folder, 
that where I have all these poems stored was personal essay. And, um, you know, there wasn't a lot at stake in a way I could write a short 14 line poem. And I conceived of the idea that I would write as many as Petrarch. So I wrote 366 sonnets in three years and I could choose any topic I wanted. And um, the form constrained me from uh, rambling maudlinly about all my ills. Um, it was over before I knew it. Um, and uh, I found it to be the perfect tool. Um, you know, people think form is a limitation, but I actually think of it as very exploratory. And I found myself writing into the rhymes. I would, you know, suddenly um, have a rhyme scheme that you have to respect, and I respected it. Um, I think of a sonnet as 140 syllables. Um, and uh, I would use my rhyming dictionary, and I'd, before I finished the line that I was working on, I'd look up the end word, and I would use that as a um, diagnostic into what I was feeling. And um, the poems accumulated, and uh, out of it came my past. I would think, John, that the, the form um, almost could have, uh, I, I'm not supposing to, um, to analyze psychologically the experience he went through, but I'm guessing, this certainly happened for me in, in my first memoir, um, focusing so much on the structure and the form, and for you, it was you would have had to be even more disciplined than I was in terms of writing short stories. Did it become, was it a bit of a relief to have to focus so much on the form as opposed to purely relying on, purely focusing on the content, especially some of the very difficult uh, personal content that you're writing? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, I think of it as backing in to the material. You know, when I first began to write, I found that if I focused on the, the image in a poem, that everything else fell into place. And, um, and it, you know, to the, uh, the experience of the sonnet, um, it forced me into, um, into thinking differently about my experience. You know, oh my God, I have to do this A, B, B, A rhyme. And, um, and you want it to be like writing form as strictly as I have, you still want it to sound like natural language. So suddenly all these obligations um, are imposed on you and your mind, uh, the content become, you know, like you're trying to fit it all in. And so because you're choosing, a, you're using a word you never would have used before, potentially, it makes it new. And um, it, it led me deeper. Okay. And, yeah. Thank you. Kieran or Madeline, do you have anything to add to in relation to that question? It'd be great to hear from you. Um, I was just going to say uh, what John said about constraints. Um, uh, I found uh, working with a um, uh, collection of linked story stories, you know, the constraint of linking those stories and making a unity, uh, it was incredibly challenging. Um, but at the same time, it, it, it almost provided walls, you know, because you knew they had to link and you knew they had to unify. And um, I had attempted, this was my attempt, to make every story a different form or type of story, you know? So like I have um, a hard-boiled detective story um, and I have, uh, you know, a, a, a surreal story and I have a retold fairy tale story. Uh, so how do, you, how do you put those together so that people when they read this work are not going to think oh this is you know really really disjointed so i found it incredibly challenging like probably the most well it was probably the most challenging work that i've ever ever done but um but those constraints really push you you know in in particular directions that you you would never have explored otherwise thank you 
And Karen, your thoughts on, on that? Um, well, Cult Life is, a, narr is a, a memoir of sorts too. I mean, it is a memoir. Yeah. It's three yeah. years spent in, in an ashram, in a kind of dysfunctional ashram with a uh, questionable guru. <laughs> and uh, a bunch of, uh, well, you heard all the people that were in it. That was inventory. So um, the, the form at first was really about me exploring what had occurred. And I, uh, I worked a lot with monologue because I wanted the voices of the people to be in the book. So there are a lot of dramatic monologues. Uh, but the narrative ended up uh, being the constraint in this case because I had to balance it with with the monologues, the found poems and the voices of the, in the voice of the guru, the kind of motherhood poems, and there are a lot of sexy poems. And so that everything had to be balanced out. And I also wanted an emotional truth as well as a kind of, uh, well, obviously a literal truth to the narrative. Um, so the narrative uh, often uh, decided, you know, um, when I needed another lyrical piece or when I needed another voice to come in and uh yeah it was a very um very enlightening process <laughs> for me as a as a, a um, an emerging writer to um to be able to use all those forms and and work with poetry and with narrative and memoir wonderful Lorna, we have a, a question that it's related to the question that i just asked but about the cover of your book the the mm -hmm. photo on the cover yeah, um, I'll hold that up. I guess it sh was shown at the beginning. Um, it's neither Patrick nor I owned a camera and we didn't like taking pictures. Uh, we didn't discuss this with one another when we met. It was just one of those lucky things that we shared. So we didn't have photographs around the house, not of his five children and not of each other, but we had that one on our shelf and it was an early photograph, probably... Uh, we'd been together maybe two years and we were on a farm in Saskatchewan visiting one of my friends and it was a time when uh, drinking beer was okay for Patrick. He hadn't fallen into alcoholism at that moment so there's a beer bottle there and he's holding one of my homemade gingerbread cookies and the hat was his but he had just plunked it on my head and I love it because, uh, because we're laughing um, obviously with delight. So that's where the photo comes from. Okay, thank you. I have another question, uh, kind of about style. It's relating to, because I have um, masters of the craft here with us tonight, uh, people don't often address in panels like this the concepts of rhythm and pace um, in writing. And I'm just really curious about um, how deliberate you are in your writing for, for those two things, for rhythm and pace. And again, anybody can take it away. In fact, it'd be fun to have a discussion between the four of you about, about that. And one of the stories that, that I worked on um, in this, in this uh, collection was um, high paced realism and uh, it, it, the pace had to be faster than other stories, right? So uh, I was conscious of um, of using pace. Uh, it, 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 you know, it, the faster pace really, uh, um, hopefully, makes the adrenaline rush in the reader, you know. Um, and then uh, unifying the different paces that that was another kind of. Uh, issue too, you know, because you didn't want like too fast paced and then, you know, kind of slower paced. You had to kind of work with those, you know. And so what would the fast pace look like, Madeline? Is it, do you affect that by punctuation, by more action, enhancing the plot, more dialogue? What, what does the faster pace look like? Right. Well, this, this story is, is called Slick. And um, it's about actually the story itself is about, uh, the death of one of these characters coming down on a toboggan hill. And so that whole movement of coming down the toboggan hill, getting run over, the brother witnessing this, but not wanting to believe it, not wanting to believe his brother, has, this has happened. Now his brother, Houdini Robinson, always got out of scrapes. He thought, 
you know, this is just uh, an act. He's going to get out of this. And so um, the brother actually starts uh, trying to, to find him and trying to get away and the movement of where he goes and, you know, and he, he gets in trouble at school and then he, 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 he tries to make a phone call and um, has to cut lines and all, all kinds of things. So it moves very, very quickly what he's doing. And it's very literal too. It's, you're not much into his, his thinking. It's more of uh, him actually um, acting. So, so that picks up the pace to the action of, of what he's doing. Thank most, you. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that most of the sonnets in my book are all a single sentence. And um, I sort of think of the form as like uh, the luge. So I think um, you know, the tobogganing imagery reminded me of this. It's almost like, or, you know, that game beat the clock and the narrative is this marble that is going down through the, the turning ramp of the form until you come to the end. Um, and, and I'm kind of, I have an affection for single line, single sentence poems anyway. Um, and so it becomes very technical because of the form. Um, and then of course there's, in the sonnet, there's something called the Volta. And so I had to put a turn there um, in the narrative or in the, in the, in the argument. Um, and um, so it's like a, it's like a, it's a balancing act. So that's how I look at, at, at the, at the pacing. Um, and I think there might be 130 sonnets in this book and there are uh, five crowns. So a crown is a suite of seven sonnets where the last line of the first sonnet is the first line of the next and the final line of the seventh sonnet is the first line of the first. And I think that's how I use, I use the form to vary um, the book a little bit. Um, and um, three of the, um, of the crowns deal with the death of my sister, the death of my father, and the death of my mother um, in some way. Or the, oh, um, profound. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, you know, you might have to uh, give a, a workshop or two, John, reviving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the sonnet form, the, the writing in the, in the sonnet form, I, I think that would just be amazing. Um, you sir, I might be the nerd in me coming out, but uh, you've got me intrigued about writing sonnets mm -hmm. and using that as a form. Oh, well, I mean, it is a kind of a nerdy thing to do. <laughs> I think, Daryl, to answer your question about pacing, the challenge that I had in my book was the shifts in time that um, much of the book was in the present moment and the present moment over three years when Patrick had to be taken by ambulance to the hospital. And then embedding that with when we met 40 years previously and even before that, before I met him, my development as a young beginning poet. And so trying to, to weave those parts together was uh, the challenge of pacing for me and um, to shift between the present and the past and to have different presents and different pasts was uh, 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 sometimes daunting. And uh, I worried that it wasn't going to work, but I had a, a very lovely editor to work with who helped me with the shaping. And just in case, unfortunately, there's no hospitality suite so we don't get to see each other after the mm -hmm. panel. In case I don't get a chance again, I just want to congratulate Kieran on, uh, on this book coming out. It's, uh, it's been a, a, a while since I've heard the poems and it's wonderful to see them out in the world and to hear that opening uh, wonderful splendid uh, list that starts the book was just a thrill for me. Thank you, Lorna. Should I share the secret that? <laughs> Please. Basically, over to you, Kieran. Lorna was actually my thesis advisor for my MFA. I was her last grad student, and uh, that book was born from my MFA. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's. Um, 
super congratulations. It's time and uh, I, you should just feel so happy and proud of it. Thank you, Mona. Thank you. And, and what about with you, Kieran, in, in rhythm and pacing when you were working on, on cult life? Did, was that a, something deliberate you had to look at deliberately at some point um, in, in the, the writing process or the editing process? Well, I think I mentioned it earlier, Daryl, when um, I was talking about uh, spacing things out because uh, some of the poems are very fast paced, um, some mm -hmm. of the monologues and uh, the piece that I read, it, it just kind of tumbles out. And so um, when I started to arrange the book in narrative order, it, it uh, sometimes it's, the, there was just so much density because it was, it was too fast. And so then that's when the narrative was telling me, okay, you need to slow down here and put something else in here. You know, what else happened? What else, what is missing? You know, and try, try and find um, ways to, uh, to break up the tumbling. <laughs> it's a lot of tumbling. Um, yeah, rhythm also just on a really, on a technical, uh, when you get into the nitty gritty rhythm was really, really important to me. The rhythm and music, I mean, it is for all of us and uh, I think the on a on a minutiae level, the the poems or the work uh, makes its own rhythms and music. You your job is to to find them as you're editing and to refine them. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit of a sidestep here uh, with um, inspired by an audience question. Um, so, and it, it's a little bit of a public service uh, question too. So all four of you have your books out in print form now and they're available for sale. Is, is that the case? And mm -hmm. uh, the other question is uh, from an audience member is if any of you are, are giving workshops on things like writing, writing sonnets or alternative formats to memoir, rhythm and pacing, the skills of the craft, that kind of thing. That's, that's uh, an interesting question from a participant. I'm always game. <laughs> um, I've, I've given a sonnet workshop actually for the festival in March. It was a great success. Oh. So I'm happy to do it again. I'm getting some sort of master class in uh, nonfiction and memoir writing for the Edmonton Nonfiction Festival oh, okay. um, on October the 18th. And I, I think it's on my website, www.lornacrozier.ca, if anyone wants to sign up for it. I don't know what I'm going to do yet or what I'm going to say. But uh, anyway, and I, this will be my first Zoom teaching. I've been avoiding it up till now, but I guess those of us who would like to keep our teaching muscles alive can't avoid Zoom teaching any longer. I think my teaching muscles have kind of atrophied a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm kind of working on a novel. And so I'm, um, I, and I haven't been asked. I mean, let's be, you know, but yeah, I, I probably do a workshop, but um, I like to maybe do something on something I'm more currently working on. You know, it's funny that the time it takes between a book being accepted and then comes out and then you're onto something else and that's where your head is at kind of, and then you kind of have to go back, but uh, yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm working on a novel, so I'm not really doing any teaching okay. right now. Madeline, I have to say, I sure wonder what happened to those girls. You ended that story at the exactly oh. <laughs> right place for me to make sure I rush out and get this book. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> They're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and Karen, do you have anything upcoming in terms of workshops or courses or anything like that? I'm homeschooling my 13 year old at present, so no. <laughs> That's a big workshop in itself, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty big. <laughs> and so is there a particular focus on writing for the, the curriculum for your 13 year old right now? Oh, we're doing a lot of literature. But her okay. favorite thing is, is comics. So she likes to synthesize facts into, into visual and, uh, and, and words as well. It's very fun. Okay, well, an, another question for me, uh, um, from me, and, you know, this is one that I, I'm working on a, a novel right now as well, my first novel, and it's um, with writing memoir, you know, it was kind of, there was a drive and a natural instinct and drive for me to do it. Um, 
writing a, a novel, I think, you know, you have a different inspiration, a different motivation. Um, I'm curious with your writing, uh, the, the recent books that you've, you've had published, uh, the ones we've been discussing tonight, how much you consider the audience? Uh, do you have a target audience in mind? Um, do you consider your audience when you think about how, how personal to be and how raw, maybe in some cases how graphic? Um, I've been working with a lot of um, uh, really uh, young writers emerging We've lost Daryl. Yeah, we've lost Daryl. Huh? He's there. He, he's back. <laughs> there he is. You're he's muted, Daryl. You're muted, Daryl. There. I disappeared and then, yes. yeah. yeah, then they came back muted. And uh, <laughs> was I asking too graphic a question? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about <laughs> <Like censorship. laughs> But that, that's an important question, I think, again, with Masters of the Craft, um, you know, because I really struggled with that and I'm struggling with that with my current novel as well. Like how much, how much, at what points in your, in your craft do you consider the audience and how does it impact your, the content of the style and that sort of thing? I guess I kind of flipped that question and I sort of think, what expectation can I have hmm. of them? Um, and I sometimes think that I have high expectations. Um, but, um, you know, there's sort of this, I, I wrote an essay uh, called um, Vulnerability, Embarrassment and the Final Draft. Oh, I like that. And um, basically this, the, the thumbnail is that um, I want to be vulnerable in what I'm saying, but not embarrassed with the sh how I'm saying it. And so, um, uh, and um, so almost like, uh, like because of course, um, a lot of what I've written is queer and you know, I've been writing it a long time and um, uh, it's about um, um, making things visible. Um, it's kind of important to me that the reader meet me halfway. And um, what I have learned uh, is people's discomfort is often a barrier for them. And uh, they, um, take that discomfort that they may have with something I've written, which I think is rather um, milk toast, maybe, um, they find otherwise. And instead of asking themselves why they're feeling uncomfortable, they um, um, blame me. And, um, and so I feel rather emphatic about it after all these years um, that they address their discomfort um, and ask themselves questions. Thank you very much. I feel um, if I thought of an audience while I was writing that I probably wouldn't put any words on paper um, because then I would be writing for other reasons than the ones that are real and important to me. And like John, in a way, I want to break silences that were present in most of my life. I don't think they're healthy. I think things need to be said. And I think my responsibility is to my audience is to say them in the best way that I can in the, in the most uh, technically adept, rhythmically pleasing, metaphorically right way that I can find. Because although um, writing may be therapeutic. I don't write for therapy. I write for the aesthetic thrill of finding in art a way to be in this world and a way to speak in this world. So in a way, I'm writing for the better part of me, the funnier, smarter, 
more daring part of me that exists beyond my computer screen. And I think I'm writing for the other animals in the world. I want to honor them and praise them and somehow protect them from the terrible things we humans are doing. And in a way, they're my audience, mm -hmm. if that sounds crazy. Um, that's who I think I owe allegiance to. And I, I owe allegiance to, to the best words in the best order as far as I can find them and make them so. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, so I, I was just gonna follow up and yes, please. the idea that um, if I thought that I was writing for someone or if I saw an audience, it would just freeze me. I, I wouldn't be able to write a word. I, you know, I, I would be afraid. Well, what if, you know, what if they don't like it? What if they, so like, I just feel that I, I need to, you know, express uh, what's there to express and basically follow the story. You know, it's, I don't really ever feel like I create the story. I feel that I'm gifted with a story that I can then follow and flesh out. Uh, you know, um, so yeah, I, I, I think like Lorna, I, I, I couldn't perceive of an audience. It would, it would stifle me. Thank you, Madeline. It's how. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. I, I didn't actually think about my audience at all until I got you know, at, at least three quarters through and then I realized that some of the words that were used in the ashram, some of the, the terminology was just too obscure and no one would know what I was talking about or would have a really hard time following. So I shifted some of the language into, uh, into using some Sanskrit words that are more easily Googleable. And mm -hmm. well. <laughs> that's about the extent that I consider the audience. Also, there's the element of, oh my goodness, my parents are going to be out reading this. That's that's the <laughs> the audience I was really considering apart from mm. those words. Okay, my question uh, and answer function is working a little bit better since I kind of got rebooted, so that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> a question for Madeline and others. In our writing, we often see patterns in our concerns, preoccupations, types of characters, etc., Were you surprised by any of the characters and conflicts that arose out of these styles you don't typically write in, like a hard-boiled detective story, for example? In other words, did trying a different style or form in fiction take you in a surprising direction in terms of subject? Interesting, yes, definitely, most definitely. The characters revealed themselves to me in ways that they surprised me. And uh, um, yeah, and again, uh, that having that form, that kind of constraint, uh, you know, it, it does um, open up all kinds of possibilities that, uh, that you wouldn't naturally, you know, you, you wouldn't naturally go to, I think. Okay, does anybody else want to comment on that? Question? Uh, well, I've written in very, a lot of different forms. And um, again, I think they each make you think in a different way. And they exert um, pressure on language in different ways. And so the result is different. And I guess why I'm interested in, in this is that it doesn't allow me to ever get bored. Um, <laughs> And because sometimes, you know, you do the same things over and over again, and they get a um, little bit uh, banal. So I, I, I love form. And, um, you know, even within the sonnets, I think they're, I tried every sonnet pattern that I could find, just to keep it interesting. I noticed that. <laughs> By the way, everybody who can look out their window, take a look at the moon right now. It's absolutely exquisite. It's, it's, a, it's a gorgeous harvest moon at the moment. And it's, uh, it's orangey yellow and it's staring in at us and listening to our conversation. <laughs> well, we have something to look forward to uh, in about 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, I, I wrote my memoir really as if it was a poem. I, uh, I wrote every sentence multiple times. I read every sentence out loud to get the rhythm right. 
um, to make sure the sound patterns were the way they should be. I guess because that's the only way I know how to write. I don't know another way. So I wrote 200 and some pages as if it were a long poem without lines, uh, non-lineated poem. Wow. Then the other question that's related to that, Lorna, is about um, how one selects the, the poetry for a collection in, to be published together in a book. And so that question is for the poets in the crowd. Uh, what do you think? How, how do you go about um, putting together the selecting the poetry? Or is it all going to be new stuff, new, new work? For me, when I'm working on a uh, when I'm working on poetry, I wait till my file is pretty thick, and then I say, "Oh, I bet you there's a book here," <laughs> and, and then I decide which ones I want to keep, which ones are worthy, which ones aren't, and then I lay them on the floor, and say, "Oh, this poem wants to sit beside this poem. This poem doesn't like the company. It's going to have to go out." And I do it really intuitively and instinctively, unless it's a book that has a theme, like Kieran's book about living in an ashram. If the book is thematic, like God of Shadows was, for instance, or my, my poems about uh, objects, then, then that's a different matter. But for poems that are just, you know, you write so many poems over a three-year period, are they going to want to live in the same house or not? That's something I usually decide after when I, when I try to let them make those decisions for me. Here's a question that's very apropos. Um, have any of you, the, the four panelists, spotted any difference in your writing since the advent of COVID? Have you been writing less, more, more intense um, work, less intense work? Cool. Um, I, I was writing a lot at the beginning. And um, I don't know, because we were all isolated. Now we've learned how to connect um, differently. So I find that my time is filling up with non-writing work. But um, um, I think I'm a, sort of, a, a, I'm on a sonnet hangover. <laughs> so I've been writing, you know, long poems, like six or seven or eight page poems. Um, so having that expansiveness of this of form of a different uh, footprint huh. has been kind of a lot of uh, fun, shall we say? Yeah, I, I'm finding the COVID times great for novel writing because I, um, you know, I, I'm closed away and I, uh, you know, I'm I'm not really going out much at all and. Um, and I got myself one of these uh, bike desks, you know, where you just, because I need my exercise or I'll, I'll just get very depressed. So I'm on my bike desk and I'm, I'm writing the novel and, um, you know, I, 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 hours go by and the outer world isn't really calling me to do much. So I, I think in a way it, it was kind of helpful for, for me in that sense. I don't know how it's influencing what I am writing. I don't know. My God, Madeline, can you type on a, on a, on a keyboard while you're biking? Yeah, yeah well, I, I take little rests, right? So, you know, because <laughs> I'm kind of, I do it and then um, I, I read back and I'm biking and I read back what I've written and then, you know, I, I take a little rest and I, so that's how I work it. So it oh, sounds that's like amazing. Cotton Jenny. <laughs> what? So it sounds like the Cotton Jenny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Cotton Jenny, exactly. If you pedal faster. <laughs> yeah. What I'm finding is that I'm, I'm involved in uh, getting this book out into the world. And I always find after having done a major manuscript um, that I feel like I'm never, ever going to write again. Um, I'm busy with things like this and interviews. And that doesn't allow my head to go where it needs to go to the next writing place, the next writing project. So I'm not sure if COVID has slowed me down or if it's just what normally happens to me after a book comes out. You end up talking about it so much that that's where my words are going. What words I have are being used up describing this book rather than uh, finding a new place to be at the moment. Mm -hmm. 
I don't um, I don't have a lot to to write right now. I, I think I'm a little like John. I've got a writing hangover after editing Cult Life, but I have uh, dozens of poems that I wrote at the same time as Cult Life, but that have nothing to do with Cult Life. And uh, so I've been editing those, just going through them, like Lorna said, sort of weeding out the ones that that can't be fixed and and working on the ones that have promise. Ah, maybe they can't be fixed because they're already perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Here, and that, that you answered a, a question that had come up for you in the stream of Q's and A's, uh, but that the question also asked if, um, the, if cult life deals exclusively with uh, your experience in an, an ashram or if it goes beyond that. No, the next book is is the next half, <laughs> or the next portion, I should say. Um, Cult Life is is three years uh, as a single mother, twenty something. I was twenty eight to well, thirty one. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And there's another question for Lorna about um, when you chose the trees as inter intercessors. That's not my word, I guess. Mm to intercede on for Patrick, did you feel they listened? And have you ever chose, chosen other sentient beings to pray to? And they want to know if you've read the, the recent book, uh, To Speak for the Trees. I haven't read To Speak for the Trees. I will, I will look that up. Um, do I feel they listened? Yeah, I do. And I don't know if I should say this because I think it's illegal, but some of Patrick's ashes are under one of those big fir trees in that grove and it seemed the right place for him to be and I believe that he's feeding that uh, that great uh, green spirit and I, I visit him almost daily just across the road by putting my hands on the tree and I know of no one um, like him who so loved the world who so loved the natural world his response to all these fires in, in California and Oregon and Washington right now would be, why does no one talk about the animals and the birds yeah. that are being destroyed by these fires? His, his heart was broken mm -hmm. by what's happening right now. Oh, so sure. um, I, I, I think if, if I'm anything spiritually, I'm a pagan. And, uh, and I do believe the trees listen to us. If, uh, and we can hear them if only we would listen to them too. Uh, wonderful. I have a quick question for Madeline. Somebody wants to know the um, the brand of your bike desk. <laughs> oh, gee, I uh, it, it, you know I don't know. It's not here right now. It's not. It's not in my room. Um, uh, it got good reviews on Amazon. It's got the best reviews on Amazon. Yeah. Great. Um, and there's a question for me that um, somebody's asking me if, um, well, they're saying they'll be keen to read my first novel and asking if, um, oh, it's, it's a friend, Eleanor. Thank you for the question, <laughs> Eleanor. Um, a fellow writer, Eleanor Florence. Um, has my success with Mama Scotch slowed the progress towards the completion of my novel? Hmm. And um, <laughs> it's funny, uh, writing gets in the way of, of other writing, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so uh, I would say, yes, the administration that happens after you've published a book kind of takes up time. And then getting the second book, Pia Gao, out um, has taken up a lot of my time. Um, but I had a lull in there when I had finished Pia Gao and it was two years in the editing process and everything. And so I was able to make great strides in my novel then. And um, COVID did, uh, I'll kind of go to that question about COVID's Im the impacts on me um, of the pandemic. And, um, you know, it just sapped my energy for the months of April and May. And I, I did very little writing, probably about 20% of what I would usually do at any time. But I got a, a blast of energy in July on my birthday, actually. And um, it, was, it was just wonderful to, to get back into writing and to reconnect. And I had to take, I took a course to do that. And now I'm teaching a course on writing and um, 
it's interesting, while that takes up my time, it's got me right back engaged with the writing process, the, the, the mindset of being an author and um, reading other people's um, drafts is, is really stimulating and, and interesting. And um, so uh, that's the answer to that. The, uh, I don't think the success of Mama Sketch is really hampered. In fact, it's, it's encouraged that success in writing has encouraged uh, me in every aspect of my life. My my music life is ramped up, for example, uh, and I'm just more confident in everything. And meeting wonderful people that I've met, like getting to work with John. John edited one of my stories, as I mentioned early on, the first story to get published in the Malahat Review. And I was on a panel with Lorna last year. We were on, on at least one panel. We were on yeah, two. Yeah, I think two. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, I mean, that's so fun. You know, I just can't say how I, I can't describe in the brief time we have how wonderful it's been to experience the, the level of acceptance I felt from from people like Lorna and John and now of course Madeline and Kieran as well and uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful community and um, yeah so on that note I just welcome anybody to we're, we're kind of getting short on time here so, and I'd like to hear fr from each of you just a, a little bit um, any pearls of wisdom you have for our participants or, um, I mean, we've already had a lot. And I, like I, I said earlier, I'm so pleased that this is being recorded because there are some amazing video clips we can make from segments of each of you. Um, we've had some, some, great, um, so, some great participation tonight. So thank you very much. But just turn it over to you in any order to um, just say any, any, uh, and there's no rush particularly, but just uh, anything you want to contribute um, about your work or what, what you're on to next, um, what your thoughts are about the state of, um, of uh, writing right now in this, in this era of having to be virtual. I'd, I'd like to say that if, if anybody is interested in the readings tonight in the panel, that they support their local bookstores, mm -hmm. that they don't order online. But uh, one of the things that I think makes the Saanich Peninsula such a special place is the richness of the bookstores. And they're having a hard time of it like everybody else is. So uh, check out your neighborhood bookstore. And, and uh, if not our books, buy something else to keep them going because a, a town without a bookstore is a town without a heart. And uh, let's keep ours beating. And they've been wonderfully, wonderfully supportive of local authors as well, yes. I have to say. Yes. And Victoria's blessed with bookstores. Um, I don't think we really appreciate how lucky we are yeah. until you go to another city. And thanks to the festival too, uh, the Festival of Authors in Victoria. We didn't have it for a while. So it's so great to see that it has returned with such vim and vigor and dedication to the writing that's going on here and across the country. I really want to thank um, the producers and all of the volunteers for putting on this festival. I think we're the first gig, right? Yeah. And uh, we're the local panel, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's great to be here. Kieran or Madeline, any, any last words? Um, oh. I'm trying to, you know, when you said any pearl, pearls of wisdom, it's like, oh my God, no, I, I just can't pull that out, right? Um, oh, let me see, during these times, you know, what kind of keeps me going? I, I do think, you know, fitness, I hate to say it, because, but it's so important to keep your spirits up, you know, and to be able to get out of bed in the, the morning and um, just, you know, to write. Um, uh, I, I think that's, uh, and we're very lucky here again, you know, being in Victoria where there's a lot of space where you can actually go out and walk when it's not smoky, you know, or ride your bike or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's, I find that really balances and centers me and allows me to stay focused on a piece for a long period of time. I, I find that if I don't, you know, if I have to go three or four days without exercise, I crash and then I can't really get back into my into my work. So I, I guess that would be my, my oh. advice if you're having trouble. 
work out hard. <laughs> Thank you, Madeline. And when you turn off uh, the panel tonight, go outside and look at the moon. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I also just want to say um, that I really believe that writing, no matter what the, the genre of writing, is a blueprint of the consciousness. And let's not let like Netflix and social media be the blueprint. Go out and buy a book. Let it be Canadian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I'd just like to echo a comment that Lorna made about congratulating the organizers for shifting pace so quickly and so effectively. You know, we're the first up tonight, but I've been so impressed with how professionally it's all been done and how mm -hmm. streamlined and smoothly it's been operating. So thank you to the organizers and, and the technicians. And, um, you know, in, and this is happening across the country as well. It's just wonderful to see the, the transition. So it's about time to wrap up. So I'm going to turn it back over to, the, to Keegan. And um, I'd just like to thank you everybody. Hi, hi, Kinanis uh, Komitin for uh, being with us this evening. And thank you so much to the panelists, my heartfelt um, gratitude to you. And it's one of the sad things I know uh, we would probably going for, for a drink now after this and uh, mm -hmm. there'd be hugs and uh, yeah. handshakes and uh, so virtual all of that to, to yeah. each of you. Back to you. Yes. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much for attending this panel. And thank you especially to our moderator and authors, Daryl McLeod, John Barton, Lauren Crozier, Kira Regeer, and Madeline Sonic. If you are interested in purchasing any of the books featured today, please support festival sponsor and VFA bookseller, which came up earlier, Monroe Books. You can find the books featured during the festival in store and online at monroebooks.com. There are many, many more events over the coming days, so please visit our website, victoriafestivalofauthors.ca, to view our festival program. Our website also features Q and A's with all the authors participating in the VFA 2020 and a place for you to sign up for our newsletter. If you would like to support the festival in another way, please follow us on Facebook or Twitter and encourage your friends to attend one or more of the upcoming events. It's uh, super fun to do this at home with friends. <laughs> you can also make a tax deductible donation to the Victoria Festival authors through our website or on the VFA page at Canada Helps. Your donation to help keep the VFA an engaging, accessible and sustainable festival. I know right now there are over a hundred people watching. So if each, each, and every, each and every one of you gives between 10 and hundred dollars, guess what? That's gonna make the next year's festival even better. So uh, we hope to see you at our next event, which is Queer Existence is Resistance. And that's tomorrow at 7.30 Pacific time. This event features authors Serena Bendar, Danny Ramadan, and Jay Simpson. And it's curated and moderated by KP Dennis. So thank you and good night. <laughs>